We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight, we're doing a follow-up on last week's episode where we discussed board game ending mechanisms based on a question from patron of the show, Dr. Donna Bowman. So that episode, for those who haven't had a chance to listen or watch it, we understand things happen. We talked about what happens once the end of the game is triggered. What do you do? Do you finish out the round? Does the game end immediately? Do you go around the table once more turn? Does everyone but you get one more turn and so on? Well, we discussed the most common ways to wrap up, highlighted unique and interesting end game systems, and talked a bit about what makes for a good end game. Now, the thing is, while talking about this on the show, and even when prepping and doing research for last week, we kept slipping from the actual end of the game to what happens to trigger that end game, what causes the game to end. While thinking about end game mechanics, we found we couldn't help but talk about end game triggers. Now, while we did a pretty good job of staying on topic, everyone, both of us, Deanna, our moderator, and many of the people in the chat, noted that they thought the topic of end game triggers would be an even more interesting topic. And here we are. Hopefully, we were right. So, what do we mean by end game triggers? Well, that's the thing that happens in the game to cause it to come to an end. What happens before everything we talked about last week? While your game end may end after everyone else has a final turn, what we're talking about is what causes that final turn to start. It's that part of the game that you may be either rushing to activate or stalling to avoid, depending on how you're doing in the standings. Now, what I really want to get into is some unique end game triggers and some of our favorites, but let's start about by talking about some of the more common ones out there. And there's surprisingly few of these once you realize that a whole bunch of dissimilar games have the same triggers. To that end, I want to start with the race game, where the end is triggered by someone getting to a set end point. Now, when I say race game, most people are going to think like car race, foot race, or something like that, where someone crosses a finish line. And those exist. Rallyman GT, Formula D, Flem Rouge, uh, Monza, kids game, all kinds of that. But there's also games that end when you hit the final spot on the board. Snakes and Ladders being the most classic version. There's also Candyland and lots of games that I played when I grew up with awesome mechanics like roll again, move back three, move forward three, and miss a turn. But then modern games like Point Salad and Space Space. Sorry, Point Salad. Where'd that come from? Point, <laughs> point Salad didn't mean there. Point Totals can also be a target. I'm red point and I'm thinking Point Salad. Sorry, Point Totals can also be that endpoint. And the examples of these, the two big ones for me are Space Space and Catan, which are actually both played different at that point going to last week's topic. But for this point, they both end when someone hits a set point total. Right. The whole thing here with race games is you want to be the first person to hit that point. And again, the point is conceptual. Sometimes it's a physical location. Sometimes it's an arbitrary number, but it is a fixed goal to mm -hmm. be reached. Next up, uh, the one I thought of next was Last Man Standing. Now, one of the things you may not think of is that almost every two-player game is actually a player elimination game. One player eliminates the other player, thus ending the game for both of them. Now, you're also going to see this in quite a few multiplayer games, especially Take That style games and older, again, older, especially IP games. But modern games like King of Tokyo, Red Dragon Inn, or Munchkin where you're either eliminating other players. Oh, sorry, Munchkin wouldn't count. You don't actually eliminate Claypool and Munchkin. Munchkin's first player. Munchkin belongs in the last group. When you get to 10 points, you then you you then win in Munchkin. I was just thinking take that so Munchkin popped in my head. But Red Dragon in, when you're when your alcohol level and your endurance meet, you pass out, you're out of the game. Last man standing. King of Tokyo is King of the Hill. That's where the name comes from. You're playing King of the Hill over Tokyo, trying to be the last monster standing. Um, you'll find this in both at least strategic games, like that's the end game trigger in chess is you're the last one standing. Though capturing a certain piece may be a subcategory of these we didn't think of when I was working on the research. And in many take that party games where players are eliminated. And I've never understood why party games eliminated people like this, but it really is a popular party game thing. Uh, we're all going to keep having fun, but you go sit in the corner. <laughs> At least if it's a two player game, there's no feeling of being left out just of losing right yeah 
Plus, when the two-player game ends, it's usually that feeling of revenge where you're just like, let's go again. You can't really do that while you're waiting for everyone else to play. Uh, the next one would, I, I don't know, uh, it, like we didn't come up with names for each of these, but the set number of rounds. Uh, you play the game for X rounds. At the end of that last round, you see who wins. And most of these, it's the player with the most points, especially in Euro games. Um, some of our favorites are, of course, Castles of Burgundy or Terraforming Mars. But it could be the furthest up a track or the player with the most money or whoever has the most of a specific resource that wins at the end of these rounds. So there is something reassuring about the set knowledge. It goes along well with games where perfect knowledge is important, uh, where you can, if you are so inclined, calculate everything along the way and plan out that deep strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, similarly, many gamers don't like this because it doesn't allow their play to impact the game in as many ways. Nothing they do can change that end game point. Yeah, one of the problems with this, and it's something we talked about a bit about last week and something maybe we'll get on to later tonight, is player agency. You have zero player agency in a game that ends after 10 rounds or after everyone takes six turns or after you play six hands of cards. That is default set by the game. Next is another one where no player agency, and that's a set number of rounds followed by a random ending point. Here, you're going to play 10 rounds, but then you keep going with the chance the game will end each round after that. Uh, the perfect example of this for me is um, Downfall of Pompeii. You know that you seeded the last Vesuvius card in the last 10 cards in the deck. So any time after card 11 is drawn, that a volcano could go at any time. Another example of this isn't the end game trigger for Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade, but it's a trigger that starts the end part of the game which then sets a new timer that counts down. So this one's odd because it ends up that the game has very old length, but the actual very end end game is a set amount, but you don't know what that's going to be until the trigger goes off. That's a really interesting version of a random ending point that actually comes up in the middle of the game instead of at the very end. Indeed. Now this format applies some tension. Attention was a topic we talked about again last week. Uh, as another something that something that helps make a good ending. Uh, but at the same time, knowing you can't do much about it or even account for it means it's not as pressing attention as some other forms. True, though this is the one where I feel like people try to squeeze in as much as they can because you don't know when it's going to end. Mm -hmm. And they tend to take more risks and then they get riskier and riskier as it, the trigger hasn't happened. Like if you know it's going to end in the last five turns and it, you're like ready for it on that fourth turn or whatever, and you're like, no, it hasn't. Okay, I'm going to try this. Okay, if the game goes two more rounds, I'm also going to pull this off. And that's what I enjoy about that particular style. Now, another one that's uh, a set point for ending, but something that's not tied to the actual mechanics of the game would be a game running on a timer. Now, you're going to see these a lot in Escape Room in a Box and Mystery Games, but you also see them out there in other games like Galaxy Trucker that uses a sand timer or Fuse, which uses a literal timer, um, and Breakdancing Meeples, where you get so many times to roll your dice and you have to stop when the music stops. Another example would be Meeple Circus, where you're trying to build as many stacks of meeple and, and elephants and things to match the patterns, but when the carnival music stops, you've got to start stop placing. Now, in that particular game in Galaxy Trucker, it's technically when the round ends, but that also applies to the final round. And this could be an app, a watch, an old good old sand hourglass, <laughs> music playing. Uh, this trigger is designed for steady tension. Mm -hmm. Different from that last type of unknown ending, this unchanging pressure of inevitable end, regardless of what you do or don't do, you know, it's coming, you know, when it's yeah. coming and it, it's nothing will change that. Nothing will stop <laughs> that. It's very different than, than rounds because you can take yes. longer in a round to, to drag it out, but mm -hmm. the time waits for no one. And this is a mechanic that some people adore. Some people don't mind. And some people like our moderator absolutely hate. Not being able to pause to take a breath and feeling that pressure can be overwhelming and lead to um, basically locking up, right? Like just failing to be able to do anything. Well, and also, I mean, we've, we've run into, we're going to talk about this later, 
but uh, some people like the, to analyze things and like yes. to figure out the best solution. And when you've got a clock going, it becomes that much harder to mm-hmm. do so. All right, this one I still can't decide if I should even have on the list because I have a feeling that each of these are actually separate triggers and I kind of lumped them because I have a feeling this is everything. So I was thinking about it as like goal-driven triggers and where where this was coming from is adventure-style games where this scenario, your goal is to do one thing, like escape the house. But then you go to the next scenario and it's kill the Shoggoth in the basement. And then the next time you play, it's collect 80 gold so you can afford that new armor. And that's what I was thinking of. But just setting that as a trigger, every game has gold-driven endings. Like the, the goal of Catan is to get to 10 points. The goal of Fuse is to defuse as many bombs as you can in the time limit. Uh, that's that's more goal for points. So I'm not sure if gold-triggered ending, it's, it's, it's when, when it can change and it's driven by a scenario and that can change game to game i think is where i want that that's to stick out as different from the other ones yeah so i think the key for me the key to this one is scenario dependence so you're playing one game and the game doesn't change but within that game within the, the you know the scenarios you're playing or the or the the types of game within that you're playing that end trigger is going to be different depending on what you're doing, which dungeon you're in, what, you know, or which, you know, which room of the house, which time of the time you're going into the haunted house, whatever it is. Um, And now this actually sort of moves into another similar, but we're not sure whether it's different or not. (laughs) uh, And that's games where you pick every player has a different end game trigger that you, you pick or are assigned in some manner. So that one's an interesting one, right? So so everyone has a different end game trigger and and this is is asymmetric games for sure, right? Chaos in the Old World's one of the first I played that had that where everyone's end goal was different and everyone had a different way to trigger the end of the game tied on that goal. And then everyone got a final turn to catch up to <laughs> complete their own goal. And in the end though, everyone was still trying to collect the same thing in that game. So like you were doing different things to get it and you could trigger it different ways, but the end result was basically to compare points. They weren't called points. More recently, I've learned more about coin games. And of course, these the intro to coin games nowadays, Root. Um, another really good example are the Vast games. And I don't even know if Sean knows about the Vast games because they're not, I've never gotten to try them. But it's a game where in like Vast the Caverns, one person's the paladin, another's a goblin, another's a dragon, and someone's the cavern. And they each have their own goal. What I don't know is if they can trigger the ending differently or if it like ends over after eight rounds. I know there are a few games. I believe it's the Pax games where depending on which role you play, uh, it yeah. d- determines your end game uh, trigger. Yeah, uh, the Pax Imperium, Pax, yeah, uh, the, exactly. the Neil games, as I tend to call them. I haven't, I have not had the pleasure of trying any of those. Yeah, nor nor have I. But uh, you know, again, in reading up for this, Pax came up on a number of different threads involving the fact that you know, again, it's every player, every whatever role they take determines the type of end game trigger that they have right. to deal with. So yeah, I think that's technically a different one, right? That that's unique. Player based. We'll, yeah. we'll call it player so, based, so faction scenario, based, scenario based goals versus and then faction based. based. I, w- I would think faction based faction. probably fits faction based because there is another type where players get to set their own end game triggers. And I have not actually played a game in this category. I've heard about them on shows like Ludology. When doing research for this, a couple came up. Uh, I think Acroteri might have been one of them. Sorry, I'm blanking on the names I'd seen. Where at the beginning, the players are given a selection of cards and pick their own end game condition. I think that I would call player driven, not faction driven. So, so rather than, so rather than a random draw, that it's an it's a you're picking you from a known set. Well, yes. Uh, another example is um, the Benny Gesserit in the Dune board game. We're, now we're that's getting a into win unique condition. That, that's that, that's is that a win that's condition? A nope. If okay. they win, if they picked the winner of the game. Well, it's not the winner. It's also what game round it ends, which is why I was thinking it was a trigger. No, because it, if it's, they it's, pick... the way, it's how they score. They either okay. they win the game or they don't based on that guess made at the beginning of the game. Fair enough. But I, I, there are some out there where I know like the player determines. Uh, so it, here's a, okay, here's an interesting one that I don't know if this fits. 
Tales of the Arabian Nights, I uh, a fantastic role playing style experience. Man, we got to do that with Tori Cat and you. Um, but fantastic game where you're wandering around in the the lands of Simbad, and you're you're playing out the story of Shahrazad, where she's trying to keep uh, what I can't remember who the emperor or whatever interested, so he doesn't kill her. And you're playing out the various adventures. Well, that one there are two tracks, and I don't remember what they are. Let's say it's power and glory, just because I'm probably way off. At the beginning of the game, you have to decide what level the game ends at and you, you set a balance and you don't end your game until it's the first person who gets that balance that wins it. So like, like it's out of 40. So you're like, I'm going to get 30 power, but only 10 glory. And you could get more than that. But until you hit that, that triggers the end of the game, but you actually get to set that at the beginning of the game. Now I will put the caveat in that that's really dumb because the game's almost pure random. Like you're making awesome RPG decisions, but like until you've memorized a book that's this thick, you don't know what's going to give you glory versus power. Fair. Now here's one that uh, isn't on our list. Um, and this may go along with, with your idea clue. So clue ends when a player decides they have the knowledge necessary yeah. to, uh, to end the game and they may be wrong. It may not end. <laughs> and Ooh, which yeah. they're eliminated and it's over for them, but the game continues unerringly without that player until the next person determines that the, yeah. so the end game condition I would say is, that's a player driven is knowing that they have the correct information. <laughs> yeah. The, the, well, the trigger is a player calling for the end of the game. And then the win condition is, do they have the correct answer? Well, yes, but it's weird because again, if, if it's, it's, if it's wrong, have, the game could continue. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's no, it's only a trigger if they're right. That's the thing. Yeah, it's the, the PAX is calling it the I'm going to try to end the game but might fail category. There's other games that have that. Maybe yeah. PAX can help us out here, but I know I played games where you're like, I think I've got it. I'm going to end the game. And right. then you do the thing at the end and you're like, oh, I didn't have it. Yeah. And I, I, I know I own a game that does yeah, that. But I'm I, trying I, I know, to I know blank. what you're thinking of. And it, it, and it, it, it skipped my mind earlier when we were doing notes. Yeah. But all of a sudden, I'm like, as we're talking, I'm like, wait, player driven. Clue. Clue is like yeah. super. Clue player is driven. definitely player driven. Definitely. Um, an another interesting one for the queen. The group decides how deep in to put the card. But the trigger is you get to that card. So I don't know. Yeah. But you get I mean, to decide where that trigger is. So that's kind of an odd one. Yeah. And, and I mean, for for the queen, we could argue all day long whether or not it's a board game or, or an RPG as well. Yes. <laughs> uh, so... That one again is there. The end game trigger is the queen comes up. Yes, um, the the final card comes up is the trigger, but it's the fact that players can decide how deep in the deck that is. Right, but is that, that, but is that me... part of the trigger or is that part of the setup? Yeah, I don't know. We're not, we <laughs> if, haven't gone back early enough into the yeah yeah we, we haven't setup. gone back. <laughs> it's it's not late enough. It's not December twenty twenty three where we talk about game setup. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a timing, but is it timing of the in game trigger, which that, is kind of well, that's the thing though. I mean, part of this topic is, or not? Timing, I think, is a setup mechanic. Yeah, which is interesting. Like, but know, then we're talking about mechanic, variable. Yeah, but then then the the variable ending trigger, where you don't know if it's going to end this round and that round, is also timing. But it's at the end of the game, not at the setup. Well, you've set up that's a variable timer, but you the the end game me mechanic is. Um, when that timer unknown. goes off. Yeah, it's when yeah, it goes off, but because it's unknown, um, it's our unknowable, or, uh, <laughs> depending on... It, it, you have a range. It's yeah. predictable. Yeah. It's unknown, um, but predictable. Yeah, exactly. All right, all right. We're, we're getting off on a tangent. So another one, and this one I think is fascinating because this is a trigger that is used along with other triggers, usually, except for like the two-player one we've already talked about, and that is... The game ends when you lose. So this could be a cooperative game with a loss condition like Pandemic, which therefore it's standalone, or something like Twilight Struggle, where it's possible for both players to lose if they don't watch the Den contract. Otherwise, the game ends when the tug of war gets pulled. No, it's so many rounds. After so many hands of cards, the game ends. But it could end prematurely with a loss. Right. And this is something very common in co-op in co games. Uh, and I like to think of it as... The same as a the the goal condition, except the the primary difference and what separates it from the goal conditions we were talking about earlier is it's the game's goal, 
right? Yeah. It's not a player goal. It's not a group goal. The game's goal is to make everyone lose, you know, is, is to have the game itself win, mm-hmm. uh, in essence. And, and so the designer's goal. <laughs> the designer's goal, yeah. So like going back to those, we were talking about scenario-based goals. Well, most of those usually have a loss condition along with a win condition. So I think it's probably the same thing. It's a scenario-driven trigger where the scenario is like Gloomhaven TPK. Right. If every player is knocked out, that is one of the end game triggers. The yep. other is you accomplish the the scenario goal. Right. So well, I think the yeah, they are player, intricately linked. Yeah, there. they're they're very much linked. It's just the difference between you know the player the player activity or the game yeah mechanical. So it activity. doesn't have to be the game because you could have Star Wars Imperial Assault where there is an opposing player doing it, or you could have um, Descent, the original Descent first and the the second edition. Before the app. Well, I mean, is Imperial Assault not the same as player elimination? Whoever wins, the other person is eliminated. No, because it's goal based. Uh, okay. So, it, so it's the, the you know the rebels have to go open this crate, but if the Imperial player destroys the crate or kills all the imp- rebels, the game ends. Like it's all right. steal the snow speeder or whatever. They're all right. They're right. all actually very unique for for a dungeon crawling game. Fair. All right, another one. When a resource runs out, the game ends. Um, this could be a single player thing, like if your deck of cards runs out in a game of Magic the Gathering, you're out, which I know a lot of people forget that rule because it's not one of the more common unless your person you're playing against is playing one of those nasty deck depletion decks. Um, or like you run out, the, the game ends when the bank runs out of money. Owen would know this one. 18xx has used that. Or Food Chain Magnet, when the bank runs out of money twice, because there's a weird thing in that when the bank runs out of money once, there's a refresh and then the game enters its end game state. And when it runs out a second time, it's over. Now, what's interesting about those particular money-driven ones is the speed that happens is totally driven by the players. You can just cut back on spending to make the game go longer, which is fascinating to me. A container is another uh, example of that, where the players control the market, and based on how everyone's playing, you could technically extend the game as long as you want almost, until that one player is pretty sure they've won, and then they make the big thing to deplete the bank, right? That is a huge part of some of the most heaviest games on the market. Right. And a lot of people will say that Monopoly fits into this category. Uh, the game only ends when somebody's self-respect runs out and they finally just storm off. Uh, or as Snail Runs in the chat says, when someone flips the table, it's all over. Yeah, uh, that, that, that is definitely one. We're, we're going to get to that as an ending in a minute, but that, that's not the planned one, I th- I, th- I think that's that's the you knock yourself out <laughs> version. So those are the, the the ones that came to mind to me when thinking of the most common ways games come to an end. And it's really surprising because almost every game fits the first few, right? Yep. Like the 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 get to the end of the track, or get to the set goal, or it ends after a set number of rounds, which even goes into card games, right? Number of hands you play in a game of euchre or whatever, or it goes to a set number of points. Or something runs out. Like the, there's not as much variety as I was expecting. Yeah, it narrow it narrows down. There there are interesting ways to represent these various endgame triggers, which is I yes. think what a lot of games do well. But when you actually sort of distill it down to its base concept, it's oh wait no, that's one of these you know four five six categories. Um, even the really really interesting ones that you think are so unique, when you actually sort of move away all of the 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 extra game mechanics that lead to it the trigger itself is usually something a little more simple than you might expect which does lead me to think this isn't quite the conversation i wanted to have yet (laughs) i kind of want to talk about like games with really neat things going on so i think that's how we're gonna end this not end it but continue move on to move on to the end game we've hit an end game trigger we're gonna move on to the end game um talking about interesting triggers uh, for which I feel we need to start with Scythe, uh, as that was the game that started all of this talk in the first place. So I would say Scythe has a complete X goals out of Y triggers. There's 10 possible ways to end stars, and the game ends when any one player has completed six of the 10. And yeah, I guess that's kind of first to six, but it's the fact that it's a subset of 10 that to me makes it more interesting than just get six out of 10 points. I, I, to me, I just, I disagree on this one. So for me, uh, I see again, when you distill it down, 
a scythe, there's no difference between scythe and space base. Uh, one's, one six out of 10 and one is 40 out of, you know, a hundred billion, uh, you know, uh, you know, an infinite number. <laughs> See the di- yeah, but that's um, the difference to me is the fact you're limited to just 10 and you have to pick which of those 10 space base. You have a pretty much infinite way of gaining points with all the different cards and combinations and dice that can be rolled. Whereas in scythe, you have to pick from a subset of 10 that selecting six out of a subset of 10 is, I think what makes it stand out. Well, I, I, I see where you're going and I, 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 I understand, but at the same point, if you're playing the game and you're building the engine, as, as Jamie was mentioning, you know, it's an engine building game. If you're building your engine, you are going to hit these targets. You're going to hit eventually. If you, if, if you weren't to stop, you would hit all 10. Uh, so well, it's no, just cause it, it's not engine. like that inside. That's part of the thing is inside. There are definite decisions on which to go for and which not. Well, yes, but those are involved in speed. Again, given an infinite amount of, of turns, you could still be at zero popularity by the end of the game. Popularity doesn't slowly build up in scythe unless you build an engine that gives you popularity. As an example, battles, yeah, you're probably going to fight, but technically, you could play scythe for a hundred rounds and no one attacks anyone. Yeah, like, like I, I, that's where I'm thinking it's different, right? It's, it's you're making a conscious decision of I'm going to go for that, I'm going to go for that. Some See, of them, yes, yeah, like, that's, like building all your buildings yeah, yeah. is probably going to happen. Building all your mechs is probably going to happen. Putting all your guys out on the on your board is probably going to happen. So I would say three to four of those are yeah predetermined. But again, you're making you're making a choice which ones to go to or which ones yes. not. But you can't choose to. I don't. You can't really choose to avoid all of them. You you may not be able to do popularity and battles. But by 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 skipping one, you're going to go the other in the other direction. So again, you're going to get to that point. It's mm. it's about who gets there the most efficiently and, and the fastest. Basically. Well, yeah, that's that's the main um, goal of the game, right? Then we're getting into winning conditions and trying to win. I, I don't know. I'd have to look at Scythe again and what those triggers are to see if it's inevitable you would get six. Because, like, one's complete your private goal. I almost never do that one <laughs> unless I draw the cards and go, well, that's easy, and I do it. But, like, I'm not going to accidentally get my private goal. I, guess, I suppose it depends on what the private goal is. <laughs> yeah. There are some you might. But, but even uh, then, I think it's a conscious decision to claim it. So even then, you right. could just avoid claiming it if... Well, like for one, you don't want to trigger the end of the game because you're not winning being Absolutely. a reason reason why you would do that. And that's another part of this is is I find inside there's a really strong reason to not trigger Absolutely. the game. You can because yeah, those stars are not back. necessarily your points. Right. Yes. Like they're tied back. to part of it. But holding back on those is another thing that I think makes this stick out compared to a race. Because I did there when I talked about race, I clarified that the goal is to be the first to get there inside. That is not the goal. Fair. I, 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 yeah, I, I was overlooking that because I, I don't necessarily I did say that. that part of the race, but yes, you're right. See, the problem is, I mean, even in, in that point, then you can take space base out of the race as well because the first person is the there any reason win. to hold back? The first, well, the first person doesn't win. So if you wanted to hold back on 39, because next turn you might be able to pull up 12 points in one turn, whereas this point in time you're only going to get two and someone else is at 38 yeah. and might be able to get six. To me, that seems like a real edge case, though. I think in general, you're trying to get to the end of Space Base's track as quick as possible. Yeah. It, That's it's iffy. Yeah, and, and, um, and Azul, there's another one, there's another one that D, the D's mentioning, which is a good sign. You can you can trigger the end in Azul and get crushed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's good reasons to not trigger the end. Yep. So what would Azul be? Player uh, driven? I guess that's a player yeah, driven, like player Clue. Driven. You you're, we'll end it when you think you're winning. Yeah, the trigger is whoever builds that yeah. last horizontal, uh, or the first Which horizontal. Which you can be forced to do, though, in Azul. I've played to make yeah. someone else have to draft the thing to end the game before. Well, it's still player it's driven. It doesn't come you're up often. them to finish it, but it's still yeah, player that's driven. True. Um. It's either either by choice or by force. It's the force is another player, not the game system itself forcing mm. you to do it. Uh, you could also do it accidentally in Uzul, I suppose. Well, yes, that that uh, that, that actually I'm happens sure surprisingly often. On. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I've done that earlier on. In so, my... so another example is resource depletion. No tiles left in the bag or Alhambra. Two stacks of rooms gone down in Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Um, three decks of cards in Dominion. Is another example of that one, right? Which is another one, though. The interesting, like, of those, Castle of Mad King Ludwig, I think, yeah, Castle of Mad King Ludwig more so, 
and even more so uh the other one one you again you can kind of drive it like if you know one set of tiles is running low and no because ludwig gets randomly determined which card tiles come out but there are actions you can take that put out extra rooms right that could speed up the ending so that's where it gets interesting with depletion well and there's there's game there's games that uh we've talked about uh or maybe we talk about later i don't remember but there there are games where there's a set number uh zulkin there you go perfect yeah we'll, that's we'll the next zulkin. <laughs> that was the next one i was going to bring up so go for it so in zulkin it is a fixed number of rounds except yep. you have the ability to skip rounds mm-hmm. uh to accelerate the, the the solar clock um so it is fixed but there is player agency involved in a fixed round thing which is something yeah. we talked about not ha- normally happening not normally, uh, so yes. Vulcan is an exception to that rule of players not being able to adjust a fixed round count yeah which i actually like that and the other thing with Zolkin is also not only accelerating the end of the game it also makes a huge impact on the round that happens because everyone's pieces move an extra spot but that's not end game mechanics that's just a neat thing i like in Zolkin. But it, it, uh, it does affect the end game mechanic, which is a set number of turns. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, the, the thing is, Sean worded this as as you skip a turn, but is it actually just making the game shorter? Yeah. So I uh, that's that's I where actually, I'm not sure. Uh, so I what I uh, what I actually put in the notes is I you are forced into a tur- one of the turns becoming an inactive turn. So the number of turns is the same, but one of them you don't do anything. Yeah, but no one does anything. So to oh, me, yeah. that's not even a turn. Well, oh, and to, to me, it just the game gets turn. shorter. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The number of actions you are going to get to take in the game will be reduced. Correct. Yes. One way or the other. So yeah, that was one I wanted to bring up because Zolkin's definitely got an interesting one. And I'd spent too long since I played it, but I keep thinking that um Gentis with its spend your time tokens. Mm. has something interesting going on but it's been too long since i played that to remember the very end game i haven't played that since queen city conquest 2019 so i'm I'm trying like i love the fact that your turn length is player driven based on what actions you take but i can't remember how that impacts the end of the game right so uh danielle brings up disc world the board game that has a core game end mechanic of the game deck runs out so the trigger of the deck runs out but every player has their own characters that had their own end game goals that could stop the game. So if you're playing Grimes, if their character if it was having their character in the game ends normally. Having that character. So so one of the characters end was the normal end. And then other characters have their own end game triggers. That's the way I understand that. Yeah, so one of the players, it seems like the Grimes doesn't actually have a trigger. Other yeah, than it doesn't the have their own. Normally, what others have specific See, that's a cool end one. game's trigger. Yeah, that's in. So another one I was thinking about when we were talking about this goes to last week was Betrayal House in the Hill. Mm-hmm. But I think then you're getting into that whole scenario driven. It's a scenario driven ending. Sometimes the game ends when you get out of the house. Sometimes it happens when the haunt is defeated. Sometimes it happens when the haunt meets up with the rest of the group. Sometimes right. it ends when you find a specific room. But again, to me, that's just a, a yeah. extremely varied scenario driven. Yeah, essentially, it's the same as Gloomhaven with just a few more possible choices yeah. to pick from. Whatever 50 haunts where each one's <laughs> unique or whatever. Uh, next one I came up with that I really like is the ending for the Revolution series of games which I, I can't even remember all the names of them, but the one I own and like the most is 1812 Invasion of Canada. There's also two U.S. ones, and they've done... Um, I've got a Norse one, but I can't remember if the Norse one has this, the Viking one. I can't remember if it has this specific endgame trigger. I think it does, because they'll do, because this is actually one of my favorite endgame triggers, because it feels really thematic. So this is a card-driven, cube-pushing war game, all about trying to control areas on the map. Well, you have you have to play cards to move your units around and to do stuff. And you have your generic move troops, but then you also have a bunch of historic people doing things tied to what they did historically. But every deck in, for every player has a truce card in it. And the game ends, and you can just play truce card as your turn. And it's actually a good way to kind of sit back and do nothing for a turn to watch what happens. 
but the game ends when all players on one side, because in that game, you play like five players, three players will be on one side and two will be on the other. So like three are on the Canadian side and two are on the U.S. side in 1812. The game ends when play all the players from one side have played their truce card. So interesting, like like one of the U.S. players can play their truce card and two of the Canadian factions play their truce card and the keep game keeps going. But like none of the U.S. could play theirs and all three of the Canadians can and the game ends. And I think that's really fascinating because it's a player driven ending like we were just talking about, but it's also a card game based on a deck of cards. And you may not get the truce when you want to end it or even possibly just as likely if you wait too long, you'll be forced to play it because it's the only card in your hand. And I think that one's really fascinating. Yeah. So it's player driven mutual agreement, which is an odd, an interesting with your uh, faction. But uh, but at the same time, there is that randomness thrown in to skew the ability to have, make a mutual decision, right? If it, everyone wants to do it, but you can't because uh, mm-hmm. because you don't have the cards. Uh, now, another one I was thinking about was uh, that it may fall under complete the goal, but I think this stands out as unique because it's not scenario driven. And this are the 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 catch a player games, the the Scotland Yard, the Mister Jack, the Fury of Dracula, Specter Ops, and many other either one versus many or players versus the game, Top Secrets, another where you're trying to catch someone. Now in Fury of Dracula, there's a whole thing where you battle them at the end, but to me that triggers the end game, and then the battle is kind of like a final stage. I think that's an interesting subset because it's kind of goals. And it's, but it's not because it doesn't change. Every time you play the game, it's that same goal. Right. So I, I think to me, it's sort of, it's, it's, there's two, two, two possibilities here. So there's player elimination. If you catch, uh, if you catch the bad guy, that player is eliminated and you win. The other team wins. Whereas yeah. the, 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 the other side, uh, if you can evade being caught, um, you're going to win, which is the goal. Usually turn based. That one's usually turn based, right? If the, the person gets away for X turns, they've escaped. Right. No, so it's a good, so, so that's that an interesting kind of match. Of, yeah, yeah, it's that mix of different uh, opposing trigger styles. Um, Loa, like we talked about uh, in Netrunner, right? Netrunner, there's three different end game triggers yeah. in the game. That's true. Yeah, there's there's get to whatever the target is. I can't remember influence whatever it's called. Yeah, get to the whatever the set amount, but then the hacker can be killed. From either net or or physical damage, and then the um, corp can lose the game by running out of resources, which is cards in their CPU deck. Right. So yeah, that's another one with it with an interesting. Yeah. So uh, and it's, again, it's they're not different. They're they're nothing we haven't talked about already. But the fact that they've compiled three of them into, into one, one game, game yeah. makes it interesting. Hmm. Now, how about funky ones where the game ends when something breaks? I guess we'll call it. Um, Jenga being the main one, right? The game ends when the tower falls or games that use the tower like Dread or Starcrossed or maybe even like 10 candles where the last ten- candle out of 10 goes out. The game ends and everyone dies. Right. So I saw this referred to as self-destruction uh, <laughs> online. I guess. Uh, and it kind of fits. Um, it's often sort of mingled with a timer in some games uh, where if you look at a game like Perfection, um, but you have to be careful because in perfection, the timer is the actual yeah. trigger. The destruction is the end game mechanism. There's one um, we didn't get to uh, last week is the game destroys itself. The game explodes. Yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So again, that's, that's one of those things though, where, you know, you're trying to, there may be a timer involved as well uh, in games like, does junk art have a timer? The problem with junk art is it's another scenario based one because each different Sometimes it's cooperative, build the tallest. Sometimes it's build as quick as you can. There, there's various different versions of junk. Right. That's what I love about junk art is it's like 30 different stacking dexterity games in one. But it's one I of can't th- remember if any have a timer. Right. Many of them I, have rounds. What I was thinking of is, you know, if you've got a timer and you're knocking things down because of the tension and pressure from the timer, um, yes. you know, that's that's sort of you. It, it doesn't necessarily trigger the end game. The timer is triggering the end game. But the pressure of the timer is causing you to completely defeat yourself. Yes. <laughs> What's interesting is you start thinking about dexterity games. I'm like, oh, they'll be unique. So, so I got, I got to wonder: is Gokuku have a unique end mechanic, which is pull off a physical stunt? Like, like you run out of eggs, 
but then you have to place that final heavier piece on top. What what is that? Mm, like I want to say the trigger is place your last egg, so it's resource depletion. You run out of eggs, but really there's one more step after that. And if you mess up, the game doesn't end. Right. And I'm not sure what to call that. That's right. Uh what's the what's the end game trigger for Rhino Hero? We run out of cards. I th- no, it's you have to deplete your hand of cards. Mm, okay. Because you're you're wait. A resource depletion. I, I, I think it's resource depletion. Because then you you add up the 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 roof cards you play on other players. But really the end of the game is when it falls. Right. What I can't remember is what the tiebreaker is, is if you run out of cards, because they don't expect you to, which we have done twice. So technically it's when it falls over. Like you're, you're trying to play all the cards. You play your cards, which are roofs onto other players that make them do things. But your goal is to have them fall by doing that. And you give them the card. That's the nastiest. Like I can barely ever put, you know, (laughs) I can't get one round up. I'm horrible at that game. Uh, Pax is mentioning one in here. And let's see if, if, if it's something already out there. Um, the haste of the hacky sack ending. How long can you keep the ball in the air? Uh, thinking of mm. super skill pinball, which is about keeping the ball alive. Does that, does that fall into one we've already discussed or is that unique? Um, the thing with that is, is it's a random roll, and eventually you're going to fail that roll, and the ball is going to sewer. So that basically like, like, comes into 40 K, which we're going to talk about shortly. Yeah, kind of. Uh, so so super skill though, there is some skill to it because like there you use up numbers and mm. if you can keep the like if if you get enough of the bumpers, things reset and there's more to it. But there's that fact that that there's the chance you could like the trigger is you've used up your third ball. And the way you could lose your ball is that you rolled badly or you you planned poorly, you didn't play the odds. Right. So so I'm thinking it's a random ending that technically could go on forever. So it's a random ending that is modified by player action. Yeah. Yeah. Like kind of what's available, right? Like in, in different, I've, I've only watched a couple different boards get played, but different ones have different things you do to reset parts of the board. So here's one is I, I'm try, trying to think of, of, of a way this could be similar in another game. Are there any games where the end game is in the deck, but you have the ability to modify that and move the end game back further in the deck? Not that I can think of. There's got to be one like using tiles or something. Because that, that's what I'm thinking of. Is, yeah. is, is the, the same sort of mechanic would be that, right? If you've got a, a stack of tiles or a stack of cards and, some, and something in the game allows you to push that ending back further. See, that would be too difficult physically, I think, for anyone to do to find the card and move it. But I'm thinking if you have a track at the end and there's like a doom. Wait, here, anachrony. There we go. When you're playing Anachrony, you have the the doom thing that this is when the world's going to end. Right. There are certain things in the game that can move that. Right. So that's an example of it. But I was thinking like a track, right? Like here's a track from one to thirty. End game's pointing at twelve, and you can do various things to move it. Right. I know I've so seen the stuff problem like with that. that though is it takes the ra- there. There's no random. Right. Yeah, so, you do lose the random. Uh. The yeah. If yeah. So yeah, you lose the random there. A similar one would be like the Lord of the Rings, uh, the original co-op game where Sauron's constantly coming towards you. And it's based partly on how well you're doing, but also on random draws. Right. But if you're doing well enough, you can push him back. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's, that works. Yeah, yeah, some yeah. of that, that in that, it. That, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. you could also, I, I could also see, yeah, I'm actually, I, I'm, I think I'm half designing a game in my head here. There you go. Uh, there's some, there's some strange <laughs> mechanics. I don't have any reason, reason to use them, but I've got some mechanics in my head where I'm like, Oh no, I can actually think of ways to, to make the random, uh, play, but player activated deck sort of work. Um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, uh, so that is, that does seem uh, somewhat unique at least. Somewhat like, like uh, th- there's definitely the one thing. Now, one of the ones that I think is fascinating and it took me forever to figure out what game this was in. Cause I knew it. I'm like, I played the game that has this. I know it exists. And that's the random end after a set number of rounds in the Warhammer games. Um, at least some editions of them. So at least one edition of Warhammer, I have you play five rounds at the end of that round, you roll a die on a five or six, the game ends. Otherwise you play another round. At the end of that round, you roll a die. On a four, five, or six, it ends. If not, you play one more round, and that's the end of the game. So it does have an end limit, but it could end at random times in there. Now, I swear there's at least one edition of Warhammer that did this, 
where it was the round ends on a six and that was it. It never got more popular. Like it wasn't possible. And I think that might have been third edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which was known as the Champion Edition, because the game was all about like putting Carl Franz on the thing and Gotrick and whatever, Garbag Marslot or whatever. The characters dominated everything in that. And your rank and file troops basically meant nothing. And that one, if I remember correctly, could technically go on forever. Like, yes, uh, the odds of rolling a six on a D or whatever, not a six on a D six for a hundred times in a row are really low, but it could technically, you could have a never ending game of Warhammer. Now I can't confirm that I haven't kept up with Warhammer in years, but I always liked the fact that you, you never knew for sure when the game was going to end. And now these are games based on capturing objectives and destroying enemy troops. So it's always, do you rush to get the objectives just in case the game ends or do you hold back for that counterattack, knowing, you know what the odds are? It's not going to end on that last turn. It'll probably go the one after. And I always thought that was fascinating. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, that involving dice in your end game on your end game timing uh, yes. is always fraught with difficulty as a designer, uh, yeah. because you how do you plan your the rest of your system around not knowing when the game yeah. will end? Um, so I got to say, it's perfect for a game where you roll bucketfuls of dice for the whole thing. Absolutely. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to jump back a little bit in the notes here. And this is actually, I think we hit this already on Clue, uh, but we're right. going to bring it to a more modern game, and that's Tapestry. No, Tapestry is so hard because I'm like, okay, so Tapestry, there's what are five, four eras, and you have to decide when to go to each era, including the last one. And when you do that, you do a final like scoring, a final calculation of everything you get, final income, that's what it is. You do a final income, and then the game's over, but only for you. So and then, your, so you pick your end game trigger. Yes. The and, thing is, though, it usually is when you run out of resources, but it doesn't have to be. Right. And so this is where I want to default to D in the chat room there, uh, who is our tournament level, um, our tournament tapestry level player. tapestry player. Is there a reason why you would choose to? not and to or to end the game before you are out of resources is there indiana's any... already saying it right you you sort of pick it but you're stuck at the end of the game like right. you end the game when you can't do anything more right well i i mean are, are there like are resources a tiebreaker like is there a reason you might hold off and 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 not finish it because the points would just work out better that way no you want to okay so no so yeah yeah. Okay, so it's not actually player driven. Your choices throughout the game determine yes. when you end. Uh, now those, yes, kind of stuff. No, no, but during the game, I totally have ended turns when I had resources to get those bonus resources for ending first and stuff like that. Right. I've definitely done it in the game, but I couldn't think of any reason at the end of the game not to just yeah. squeeze out every, yep, every level, little penny. erg you can. Now I will say, there's a bunch of games though that have the variable player ending. And it's pretty much any game where you can pass, which Tapestry is one of them. And I guess it would be a, I'll call it the pass you're out, game's over for you, ending of Lost Ruins of Arnak is another example. Although there's, it's interesting because there's a sum of these games where you can uh, sort of hedge your bets. You can pass, but if not everybody passes, when it comes back around yeah. to you, you can play again. Uh, yeah, which is every auction game pretty right. much. Right, so you can, you can pass and hope that somebody else does something or everybody passes and it's over. Yeah. Um, but there's a chance to get back in. So. Um, yeah, that's definitely the, but the, the, again, most of those are end round triggers. Yeah. So I shouldn't say every auction game. There are definitely auctions where you can't go back in when you pass power grid, the power grid style auction. You can't, but many you can right. jump back in. Yeah, should I spend my resources or where will I get points for them? Actually, there, there's another topic. If we're going to keep deep diving game mechanics, we should talk about is the tiebreaker mechanic. Because designers, pay attention to this. If you make something a tiebreaker, you just made it more valuable than anything else in the game. Yep. Like if gold's your tiebreaker, everyone, well, anyone who plays well is going to realize <laughs> if you have an equal choice, take the gold. Realize yep. you're doing that because I think some designers and playtesters miss that, that they don't even consider the the tiebreaker mechanic. That's a total side topic that maybe we'll save for another week. 
I really don't expect to just digest, di- dissect games for all of 2023. Hopefully we've got some really good questions that are brewing in our, from yes. our audience that are going to come in <laughs> and we'll just I, have to take those instead of just picking our own random topics that we enjoy. Yeah, well, no, this is started. This this wasn't, I think, a logical follow up. But to be honest, I ca- we could dis- destruct, deconstruct games all year, but I think there are better qualified people to do that. And I recommend you check out, say, the Ludology podcast, for example, <laughs> for for professional game designers instead of people who just played a ton of games talking about mechanics. Not not not, not like an imposter syndrome here, but we are not game designers. I, subscribe to Jamie's blog. <laughs> ah, Jamie's blog is fantastic. A player and a designer is somebody put something out on uh, put something out for other people to play as well. Yeah, you have true. to play a lot of games to become a good game designer. In general, yes. Uh, so, uh, so what's another one? Um, you know what? Let, let's move on to talking about some of our favorite end game triggers. Um, I particularly picked one, but as we talk, maybe we'll come up with some other ones. Out of all these different end game triggers, I think my favorite is the race, but it's the race combined with the everyone gets one more turn rule that we talked about last week where getting X triggers the end, but you can go past X. And then once everyone goes around, it's a player who has the most that wins the game. Um, Space Base, we brought up multiple times tonight as an example of this. Russian Railroads is, I think, my favorite game of this type. And then there's also Terraforming Mars, though it's not X points, but rather getting to the end of the three tracks. Someone's going to trigger the end game and you can go past it. So I'm not sure if Terraforming Mars quite fits in here, but it's definitely Space Base, Russian Railroads. I'm sure there's other ones. Those are the two that popped into my head. But I think overall, that's my favorite endgame. Fair. Uh, I have to admit, thinking on this topic, I know last week when I was talking about endgame mechanisms, uh, I was I leaned towards the bang, it's done. Everyone's, mm-hmm. you know, you, you want to you want to sneak in there and and sneak in at the end. Whereas I think when it comes to actual triggers, uh, I'm actually leaning toward the set number of turns. And this is actually because I'm frankly not all that great at games. I freely <laughs> admit I'm not the best game player in the world. Uh, and especially at the beginning. Whereas if you know you have a set number of turns, the next time you play that game, you're working with a, a, a knowledge base and you mm. know it's going to end at the same time. So you can try something different. You can think about what did and didn't work and you can adjust your play style accordingly. Whereas if you've got that random ending of turn, it's harder to compare play A versus play B and see what went wrong and what didn't. Yep. Um, so it, it's you're able to be more experimental in learning the game if there is a set number of turns. So I think this fits for you because you don't play the same games as often. Now that you're in Windsor, it's happening a little more, but like you're not the one playing the games five times in a row and getting to that level of mastery where I think that's where that might shift where at this point you like learning games and want to get better at games. So you want the same, you want, you want to control like when you're doing a science experiment here, you want, you want the control as the game is going to end the same way next time I play it. Right. Whereas tapestry, it's going to end differently every single time you play the game. Um, It does feel like it. It ends at different points with totally different scores. Well, and, and I mean, the big problem with the with uh, with tapestry is you'd have to convince someone to give you the same. Uh, oh, gee. Yeah. And even then, <laughs> like so many, they, there's so many random factors. Many variables. You're, yeah, you you're, you're, you want to control for one variable. And in tapestry, that's just not possible. Like, like everyone would almost have to like go up the same tracks to even try to learn <laughs> a different strategy with the same thing, which just isn't going to happen. Right. Like I, closer, like it'd be like a Terra Mystica being another example with the 13 different factions. Even if you get everyone to play the same factions, they're still going to play different because people are going to build different things first and choose different starting locations. Yeah. But at least that one has a set ending. Yeah, I would say uh, Clans of Caledonia actually has a pretty solid uh, learning uh, system. You know, if you can play the same, same clan again, you can you can learn a lot uh, yeah. more about it every time you play. In in the single player solo uh, multiplayer co op a- aspect of the game, yes. When you're not trying to cut other people off and steal things other people are trying, which if everyone's kind of focused on their own thing, then definitely. Right. 
Now, my second favorite would probably be the mission based ones. I like campaign games. I I like Gloomhaven. I like all those <laughs> games, and I love the the various. The, a better example we're we're gonna bring up a game that we haven't brought up in quite a while is Adventuria. I am shocked by how different that game feels each scenario all using the same mechanics every time like even playing the same deck of cards with maybe one card difference is all that's changed in the deck how engaging it still is to try out different scenarios so that that's probably my number two favorite trigger is the give me a goal <laughs> as like a scenario driven goal where the next time i get a different goal but i have to use the same resources it's using that same resources it's the playing Gloomhaven and playing the next scenario with the same character who might got a little bit better, but in general, using those same resources to try to accomplish something different, which is probably why I enjoy role-playing games so much as well. Fair enough. I mean, that's kind of the, the ultimate uh, variable uh, player driven scenario uh, yes. based goal is, uh, is RPGs. So can you think of a game that you do like the end game trigger that does the immediate ending where you can, you know, pull off the big combo at the end of the game. No one was expecting. Uh, well, I know. I think last week that my uh, stop or the, the, the stop sign game um, was the can't stop. Can't stop is one of those, but there, um, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, Azul is close, but not quite. It's because yeah. everyone does get to, to wrap up, but you've, you've, you've triggered the end game and it's like, <laughs> you aren't going to get to pull. You up. aren't going to catch know, up. You're not yeah. going to catch up now. Cause I've, uh, you know, they're, they're you're not getting those five there. red yeah yes. exactly or 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 you are getting those you know eight red that are sitting there that are gonna well yeah I, I was the, thinking uh, of getting all five red on your scoreboard yeah yeah is the one i was thinking of is, is you're like oh you have that spot you already put a blue there i'm gonna end it this round so that yeah, doesn't yeah. clear um yeah no I, that's that's definitely the you know sort of one of them that comes up um the other one is well it's interesting haggis uh, which is a, a trick-taking game we play uh, on BGA. Uh, you trigger... So the first person who's uh, done with their cards is out, but the other two keep playing for second place. Mm. Or whoever else, you know, whoever else is okay. playing yeah, yeah. plays for second and third place. But you trigger your end game uh, by playing your last card before anyone else. But they can't go past you? Uh, they won't get more score. Their score can't go up, go, okay. go beyond you. Yeah, no. But again, so that's, that's interesting. Yeah. So the, um, oh, that, yeah, but that's actually end round. That's not end game. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so, I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Is yeah that... No, that's, well, honestly, I'm trying to remember what the actual end of thing. <laughs> I, it's a, I think it's a point. I think it's, a, I think it's a point race. A point I think, thing. uh, I'd have to double check the rules. So one, one we talked about last week that I don't know how that falls in here is, um, the, the, the game ends when no one can move. We hadn't talked about. So there's a mm. different type. So, uh, hey, that's my fish. Um, Battleship. Um, what's another one? Uh, Corridor. Is that the one? Yeah. Well, what about no? So arguably, chess can get into that, right? Yes. You can get into that. Yeah. You chess actually. The... When I was researching this, chess has two end games. Mm -hmm. One is capture the piece, which this particular article called out as a type of game. So strategico, you got to capture the thing. Risk if you capture, or not risk. A strategico if you capture the flag. I think it is in strategico. They brought up capturing the 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 um king in chess and almost all of these games also had a side end condition of or it results in tie if no one can make any moves so so chess technically it's not you can't make any moves but um stalemate right like there's no now the one that is the end game condition is your opponent can't make a move is checkers i mm. guess is is one of the very i guess that pro checker players don't tend to eliminate each other they tend to get to a point where the one player can't move anymore right uh, and Haggis is 350 points for those wondering. So that's, a, that's just a point to <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like a Racco to... or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. You just keep playing. Uh, what's Racco? Goal? Yeah, it's point, point total. Well, it's, it's points, thing. but okay, what, what's the what's the round trigger? Goal? I guess it'd be goal, right? Get your cards in order? Yeah. I'm just wondering. See there, round triggers, round end triggers it's could tri be a whole... It's, play it's, it's player triggered though, right? Because you decide. Yeah, but you if if you get it, you get it and you win. Like if you miss it, that's you playing the game wrong. Well, <laughs> that's not. Yeah, but you can't be like, oh, I think I have it. You have it, or you don't. It's well, yeah, it's, but you don't have to get them all in order. Yeah, you do. 
Oh yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, I was trying. Yeah, to, I was do. thinking. I was thinking you could. Yeah, no. That right. would be an interesting variant that you yeah. could call it early if you think you have enough points. You have more than everyone else, <laughs> right? That'd be an, that'd be a, okay, there. You go. We might have came up with a gamers variant of Racco, <laughs> where you can call just Rack instead of Racco, and <laughs> and and you actually you actually call it. Yes, <laughs> you're too drunk to be playing Racco. Yes, you you either there have Racco or you're too drunk to be playing Racco. Oh. Technically, you lose the game if you turn around your rack and it's... Right. All right. Well, I think uh, we're pretty sure... I'm pretty sure we're at the trigger to end this topic. Fair enough. So we would love to hear about your favorite ga end game triggers in the comments below. In a moment, we're also going to be checking in with our chat room here on Twitch to see what they have to say. Now, the audio of that, uh, for those who can't be here live, does go out to our Patreon backers at the hotel guest level or higher, which you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Now, before we do go to the lobby, just a reminder that we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Sometimes we take two episodes to cover a full topic because we get so involved. You can send questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop, emailing Mo at no, sorry, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Actually, Mo will work too. But questions is technically where they get filtered. Uh, or you can send uh, us a DM or hit us up on social media, tabletopbellhop, one word, 